That's right. Okay. Um, so I'll continue with the tour of uh, more applications of communication, but uh, before I do that, I want to make a few comments about this proof, uh, because several of you uh, told me interesting things during the break. Uh, first, uh, uh, Arkadev pointed out that uh, this proof actually appears uh, in a paper by Klauk, um, which I, I didn't know about. Uh, so uh, it should be credit to. And the second is that uh, two people, Ryan and Shikant, both independently suggested a, a different way to view the same protocol, which, uh, um, which is nice. So let, let me just say what that is. So one way to think about what's happening in this protocol is, uh, you know, so Alice has this input. She doesn't know some of the values of the input bits here, but she knows most of them. So she needs to send a message to Bob so he can compute this function. So what she can do is just evaluate this formula as much as possible. So she takes her input and just plugs in the values that she does know, evaluate the formula as much as possible. She'll end up with a smaller formula. This is kind of like shrinkage, right? And in this formula, there will be some gates which, which have only one input coming into them. Uh, but those can be just eliminated, right? It doesn't make sense to have a unary gate. So in the end, you end up with just a, really a formula, and then you just describe, Alice can just describe this formula to Bob. And this also would give the same parameters and it's basically the same proof, um, but maybe it's nicer in some respect. Okay, so that's uh, about uh, Nishpur. And <clears throat> the next result that I want to talk about is uh, I want to prove a lower bound on monotone circuits. And this is something that, uh, again, Pavel alluded to in his talk, in proof complexity. So let me remind you what the model is, and then we'll prove a nice lower bound. So the model uh, monotone circuits. So here, uh, uh, every every gate you're you're only allowed and in OR gates. Okay. So every gate computes either the and of its inputs or the OR of its inputs. So such a, such a thing can only compute monotone functions. Um, and the lower bound I want to prove is a result of uh, Raz and Wigderson, uh, which also builds on, I guess, work of Kashmir, Raz and Wigderson, and then Kashmir and Wigderson. Uh, and what they prove is that uh, matching requires omega n depth. So I'll say what that, that means. Second, what is matching? So <clears throat> the input to the matching problem is a graph. And the thing you're trying to figure out is does a graph have a large matching? Okay. So match of G. Uh, G is a graph. And uh, it's one if. Uh, G has a large matching. And uh, for the purpose of the proof, uh, I think uh, the parameter that I'll need is the matching of size. We'll be looking for matchings of size roughly uh, n over 3. So the graph has n vertices. And you know, does the graph have a matching of size roughly n over 3? We'll see what we get in the proof. And otherwise, you're supposed to output 0. <coughs> now, this is certainly a monotone function, meaning that uh, as you add edges to a graph, it can, you know, once it contains the matching, it can only it continues to contain the matching. Okay. So it can be computed by a monotone circuit of this type. And what we're going to prove is that uh, such a circuit, any such circuit, must have uh, omega n depth. There's no shallow circuit that computes. Okay. Is the is the model clear and the the problem? Okay. <coughs> okay so. As usual, we'll, we'll reduce to communication, and again, it'll be uh, these are both sort of uh, circuit models, but the reduction to communication will be very different. We'll use uh, a reduction, a kind of a connection that was discovered by uh, Kashmir and Wigderson, and then specialized to the case of monotone circuits by I believe Kashmir, Raz, and Wigderson. <coughs> um, so, he, so here's a key idea. So let me let me just tell you how you can go from uh, a circuit to a protocol. 
and then we'll we'll see we'll we'll try to prove that that protocol must have large uh, communication. So how do you go from a circuit to protocol? So here's a natural thing you can do. So suppose suppose you somehow construct. Uh, so so here's here's something that Alice and Bob can do with such a circuit, okay, a low depth circuit. So suppose Alice has a graph. Uh, um, okay, so let's say G that has that has a matching, has a large matching, and Bob has a graph that does not have matching. Then what, what Alice and Bob can do is they can use this circuit. So these graphs cannot be the same, right? But not only can they not be the same, uh, this graph must have an edge that's not in this graph. It cannot be that H contains all the edges of G, otherwise it would contain the matching. And this circuit allows Alice and Bob to find such an edge. Okay, so they can cheaply communicate to find uh, an edge E that's in G, but uh, E is not in H. And, and how will they do that? It's a very simple reduction. <coughs> uh, they both know the circuit. Okay, they both know the circuit. So Alice will plug in the edges of G in the inputs, and Bob will plug in the edges of H. And uh, for you know this circuit will output, you know this gate here will output. You know, f of g equals one, and or a match of g. Well, here is f. So it's not, it computes some function, and that function evaluates to one on g, and on h has to evaluate to zero. <clears throat> but now this is an AND gate, right? So the AND of the two things feeding into it for g must be one. So here, you know, you must have uh, if this computes a function g, you have a g of g is equal to one, and this computes h, you have h of g equals 1. On the other hand, <coughs> the end of these two uh, must be 0 for Bob. So one of these gates must evaluate to 0 for Bob. So you must have, say, h of h equals 0. So Bob can send just one bit to Alice to indicate which of the, which of the gates uh, has this pattern, 1, 0. And now we're exactly in the same situation as, as before. This is, this is the whole reduction. So Bob just tells, they both evaluate their, their circuit. We know that the output of the circuit is different for both of their inputs. Um, <clears throat> so that means one of the inputs feeding in must be different. But not only that, it must be the case that there's some input, uh, some gate feeding into the output gate where Alice sees a 1 and Bob sees a 0. So Bob will communicate. In this case, Bob will communicate if it's an AND gate. If it's an OR gate, Alice will send one bit to indicate where the difference is between them. But uh, they just keep doing this. And after they do this, if the circuit has depth D, after they do it for D steps, they will reach an input. And the input will be exactly some variable that's uh, you know, uh, a bit indicating the presence of an edge. And that's exactly what they want. They will find. Uh, you know, Alice will find that the edge is in her graph, and Bob will find that the edge is not in this graph. So any circuit of depth D gives actually a protocol here whose communication is, ex you know, exactly D. It gives you can, with, after communicating D bits, you can you can uh, solve this problem. And now I want to show you that you must you must spend omega n bits to solve this problem. Okay. <coughs> So here we are interested in deterministic communication protocols. That's right. Yeah, so this proof is really interesting. And one of the reasons it's interesting is for, for the reason that you, you just brought up. So this is about deterministic protocols. But actually, now to prove the lower bounds, I'm going to appeal to randomized communication complexity. Okay. So it's kind of a strange and tricky reduction. So, this is, so far, it's just about deterministic protocols. But now I need to prove 
this lower bound, and I, I will actually reduce this problem. Uh, I will show that they can use this protocol to get a randomized protocol for this shyness. That's how I'll prove the, the lower bound. Yeah. Are there any requirements we need to make on Fanon? Uh, or uh, here, I just assume that the Fanon is two. But if the Fanon is larger, you know, you can you, with a small blow up, you can always make the Fanon two. Like if you have an OR gate of as long as it's size. Any other comments? Yeah. Uh, when you need to do that, the circuit is monotone. Where did I need? To? Okay, so what happens if the circuit is not monotone? Does someone else see where I use the monotone? I believe everywhere. <laughs> everywhere, but also <laughs> the deeps. You're both right. Uh, so the, the problem is, if it's not monotone, it could be that these two have different values, but here, the value is zero one. You know, it could be that h of g is zero, and this is uh, this. They, they, so you know, if the fi final value is different, one of the inputs must have a different value, but it doesn't need to differ in this specific way, where the output on g is one and the output on h is zero. Yeah. So yeah. So if I was looking for just that there's an edge where there's a difference between g and h, I didn't need that the circuit is monotone. Okay. But I want that actually the edge should be in G and not in H, the specific difference. And somehow that difference is the difference between monotone and the non-monotone. Exactly, okay. yeah. Yeah, so the, the same connection does work for non-monotone circuits as well. That's a karshmer wigderson game. Um, and you can use that connection to prove uh, some lower bounds, but this is an even stronger kind of protocol. It's not just finding a difference in the inputs, but this kind of difference. And uh, we'll use that in a second. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned you're going to use randomized <coughs> communication complexity. The one thing that makes uh, the non-monotone case more challenging is that there is, always is a randomized protocol that solves it very yeah. efficiently. That's right. Is that also true for the monotone case? Uh, n no, I don't think it's true for the monotone case. I mean, that's what. Yeah, that's why we're able to. to do that. Okay. So yeah, so what Russell is saying is that suppose I just wanted to find an input where the values are different, rather than being different in this specific way. So uh, then you know I can just ignore the circuit. There's always a cheap protocol, a randomized protocol, cheap randomized protocol. To do that. I just have two binary strings which are different, and I want to find one input bit that's different. You can just use hashing and binary search to find this bit. Okay, so this will give you a cheap randomized protocol to find the bit. So somehow, uh, th then lower bounds, you know, there is no lower bound communication, so you can't use that approach on randomized protocols to say anything. But, but here, this protocol has to find basically only a one zero in the difference. And uh, there is no randomized protocol that can do that cheaply. So the, the bad thing that could happen is use hashing, and every time you find 0, 1, 0, 1. You never find a witness that's of the type 1, 0. More questions or comments? OK, good. So, so that's now I want to prove that this communication protocol uh, requires, uh, so this is what I want, I want to prove that uh, omega n bits required, are required. <clears throat> and uh, the way that I'm going to do that is by redu reduction to uh, the communication complexity of disjointness. So uh, let me uh, show you how the reduction works. So for, first I'll show you a deterministic reduction that doesn't work, and then we'll try to patch it up. So, so uh, say Alice and Bob have sets uh, x and y, uh, and they come from some universe slash n. So, <clears throat> and they, they want to compute, uh, they want to know, are these sets disjoint or not? This is a question they want to solve. And we know, uh, we know that this requires uh, omega n 
communication, uh, even for randomized protocols. This is, uh, this is perhaps one of the most important results in communication <laughs> complexity. Uh, oh, M, yes. Okay, you need linear, linear uh, bits of communication. Um, it's proved first by Kalyana Sundaram and Schnitger, Schnitger, and then uh, Rasborov had a very nice proof, and then there have been, been several other proofs that have come since then. Um, <clears throat> okay, so that, that's the problem. I'm going to show that if you can solve this problem, then you can solve this problem. So how does it work? It's just uh, sort of like a, one of these NP-completeness gadget reductions. So here's what it looks like. So here's a set X. I'm going to write the indicator vector for X and then describe two graphs, right? What I want to show is Alice will take this X and map it to a graph. This graph will have a large matching. Bob will take his, his set and map it to a graph, and this graph will not have a large matching. And then they will run that protocol. And somehow the output of that protocol will tell them whether or not these sets are disjoint. So let's look at um, let's look at the indicator vector for x and y. Okay, and so say this is zero, one, one, zero. So here's what Alice's graph will look like. So if she sees zero, she will go like this. There are going to be three vertices here, and if she sees one, she will go to the right. So this is an edge. And uh, what is Bob going to do? So Bob, let's say he sees uh, one, one, zero. This is what Bob does. So I've actually used Bob's input to pick a set of vertices. And what, what Bob's, the, the graph G is exactly this. This is G. And H is uh, the set of edges touching the squares. And actually, so there's one, I need to patch this up. So and there's one more edge that G has. This is the reduction. So let's see. Let's see what it does. So uh, first, G is exactly is a matching. You know, the, the the size of the matching is m plus one. For every input bit in uh, in Alice's input, there's an edge. Okay, and then there's one extra edge that I've added here. So G has certainly has a matching of m plus one. It is a matching of size m plus one. Um, and what is y? Y has actually way more edges. So y, the input to Bob determines m vertices, and uh, it's all the edges that touch these vertices. All edges that touch these vertices. So in particular, y does not have a matching of size m plus one. You don't see the edges. I haven't drawn the edges of, uh, sorry, uh, H does not have a matching of size M plus 1. Is there something confusing? So are you saying it's a complete graph on the squares? No. no. It is the complete graph on the squares and more. It has also, the, you know, this edge is in H. Okay. Uh, this edge is in H. This edge is in H. These dotted edges are all in H, but it has many more. It's all edges. All, all, every edge that touches a square is an H. In the complete graph. In the yes, in the yes. Every pair of uh, vertices that that intersects a square uh, is an edge in H, and these are exactly the edges. So every edge must touch a square. Every edge must touch a square. An edge is included in H if and only if it touches a square. So. Which edges are not in H? So for example, there, this edge is not in H from these two, because it goes from non-square to non-square. So a complete bipartite graph, right? 
No, no, it's just like there. Let me just draw a picture. So, this is, these are the squares, and then this is an independent set in H. Here you have a complete graph, and then all the edges from here are included, but. It's a graph with the vertex cover of size m. Exactly. Yeah. And that's uh, the proof. The point. The point is. Okay. So first is the definition of the graph. Here. No, that's okay. Now, H cannot have a, a matching of size m plus one because every you know every edge that you include in the matching has to touch a square, and a distinct square, right? Because the matchings are disjoint. So there are only m squares here. So you cannot have m plus one uh, edges in a matching. Moreover. <coughs> What happens when you have an intersection between these sets? So the way it's defined, right? So the H always, you know, goes either the bottom left or top right, and uh, the X always is like this or like this. So the feature of this is that when you have an intersecting input, which happens here, this square does not touch this edge. In all other cases, the square touches the edge. Okay. In other words, this edge is not in H. This edge is not an H. But yeah, this, this edge is not an H. So the idea would be, so this is, and this exactly corresponds to an intersection. So the edge that's not in, that's in, in, in G but not an H here corresponds to the intersection. Except for the last edge, right? Except for the last edge. And, and that's, that's, where, that's why this is not yet a proof. So, the problem is that there's also another edge, this one, which is also in G but not in H. There are two, at least two, there could be more. But there's this one. So the, the first idea for reduction is, you know, Alice and Bob do this, they get G and H. Now they just run the protocol. They find an H, uh, find an edge that's in G but not in H. If they're lucky, it'll be this one, if their sets intersect, right? If their sets are disjoint, this is the only one that could be output. But you would hope somehow that this is the one you will see. And if you see this one, then, then, then you're, you're, you know that the sets intersect. Okay. But the problem is that it could be that your protocol always just outputs this edge, <coughs> which gives you no information. It's not a witness to them being disjoint. Yeah, Russell? So they're going to randomly permute the graph yes. before running the protocol so that the algorithm, the protocol doesn't know which edge they want? Yes, exactly. Yeah, so the, the fix is that what they will do, so the, this construction has another nice feature, which is that when the sets intersect, when x and y intersect, this edge is sort of indistinguishable from this edge. What, I'm, what I mean by that is that if you pick a completely random permutation, I, and, and then feed me the graph after the random permutation, I can't tell this edge apart from this edge. Structurally, there's, there's no difference between them, right? If you just look at the picture, there are a bunch of edges that touch squares. Those will stay remaining touching those same squares. But this thing will go to some random place and has the same distribution as, as this thing. Okay. So once you randomly permute this picture, the information, the, the protocol... So, so, so here's, what you, here's what Alice and Bob actually do. They take their x and y, they construct these, then they randomly permute this graph, but they, know, they both know what the permutation is. So they use shared randomness to pick a uniformly random permutation, permute the whole graph. But this protocol, it doesn't know what the permutation is. So the chance that it outputs this edge has to be the same as the chance that it outputs this edge. So it's at least a half. But... So yeah, so it, it'll, if there is an intersection, it'll output that intersection. It'll output an intersecting edge with probability at least a half. And after you see the edge that was output, you can you know, reverse engineer the permutation to figure out whether it was one of these or one of these. So that's the, the whole protocol. So you, you just repeat this process. So you, you um, construct these graphs, randomly permute them, run that protocol, maybe you get this edge. So you, you don't stop, you, you do it again. You again permute the graph and you run it again. And uh, if you see this edge over and over, then it must be that the sets are disjoint. 
But if there is some intersection, then with high probability, after a few iterations, you will see an edge that comes from here. <coughs> yeah? Does the same work for bipartite matching? Is this... uh, I don't know if I can prove or disprove. <laughs> I don't know. Any other questions or comments? I'm, I'm sorry, actually related. What about perfect matchings? Is it, uh, do we have monotone in our bonds? Uh, again, I don't know. Uh, this is the only reduction that I, I know. There's also, Pavel actually in his talk discuss a reduction not to matching, but to clique versus coloring. And I'll leave it to you as an exercise. In this picture, you have everything you need to do, also clique versus coloring. Uh, you will use three vertices in each thing, then you will do something different from that point on. <coughs> but you will randomly permute and do something. Yeah. What if you um, take a graph and you add T new nodes that are connected to every other node. I see. So okay. then these can take up the slack and you make them connected to each other as well. So these can take up the slack but they can't. We have perfect matching. Oh, we're trying to do perfect matching? Yeah. Okay. Oh, I see, I see. Okay, I see. So you're saying you have a set here that are connected to... Uh, About N over 3. Yeah. Oh, and over, and over three, and these are connected to everything. And each other. So right. So yeah. This. Uh, actually, this is a, yeah. This is the same. Yeah. A similar idea shows up in the streaming. Uh, it's not streaming. This this is there in the original paper. Oh, it is. Okay. And yeah. BPM five hundred perfect Oh, and binary. Okay. Uh, Bipartite. Bi okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. Just a small observation that uh, when you constructed these G's and H's, then uh, even though G has an H that H doesn't, G would be should be smaller than H in order for it to be um, hard uh, for communication, because otherwise it would sort of somehow always like uh, for two parts and go with the small. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So Avishai's uh, observation is that um, if you want uh, such a reduction, you have to have that the the one of the function has to have uh, lower handing weights, has, has to have fewer ones than the, than the zero of the function. Because otherwise, there is a protocol, uh, just binary search, right? So, so when thinking about such reductions, you know, uh, yeah, if, if G has always more edges than H, then there is a protocol uh, to solve the problem. So, so in the hard distribution, you sort of are looking for this hard thing where G has actually very few edges, which is what happens here. H has many more edges, but G has a structure that H does not have. Um, it's complete on the min, min, min uh, term and max term for monitoring. You can always choose a matching, and H can be the complete graph completion without a matching. Uh, I'm not sure if I yeah. yeah. Maximal graph without a matching. Oh, I see. Okay. You're saying so instead of this H, you could have just picked. It is actually a maximum. Oh, it is, yeah. <clears throat> it's already. Uh, it's it's yeah. the maximum graph where the boxes are the vertex cover. Right. Yeah. yeah. Which is the same as so. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, uh, so let me. Uh, what was I going to talk about next? Several options. Okay, so 
I, w I want to, it's, it's a crime if I don't show you something about data structures. So that's what I will do. Um, so I'm going to show you a very interesting Lorban on data structures. Um, but uh, I think I will try to navigate a level of uh, formality that's, uh, that allowed me to, to com communicate the ideas but not get stuck doing a ton of calculations. Um, <clears throat> So you'll have to be a little more forgiving of the details here. Trust that they work. But I, I want to show you the key questions. Okay, so, so now you know, we're leaving the world of circuits, and I, I want to tell you about how you can use communication to study something about data structures, prove lower bounds on data structures. So first, what is a data structure? Uh, I'll be talking about static data structures. Uh, I'll give you definitions. I'll just give you an example. So here's a, the problem that I'm going to be interested in, and I'll explain what a data structure for that problem is. Uh, <clears throat> so the the problem that I'm going to uh, study is 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 uh, one of the fundamental problems in data structures. It's called predecessor search. So here's, here's the problem. You have uh, some universe of size n, and uh, there's a subset S uh, of, of uh, the universe, subset of the universe, 1 through n. And you want to somehow store the subset okay, in, in, an, in, somehow in, in, in a way so that later you can efficiently compute the predecessors of this the subset. So you take the subset and you encode it using an array. This is the data structure. Uh, and uh, actually, let me call this T so that I can write here S, which is the size of the array is the space used by the data structure. Uh, and, and usually there is a parameter W, which is the number of bits stored at each location. These are the parameters. And what, what the predecessor search asks for is at runtime, you'll be given some input x in n. And you want to compute the predecessor of x. The predecessor of x is just the largest element of s that is at most x, uh, of t that is at most x. So it's the maximum uh, over all the elements that are at most x and uh, in s. This is the predecessor of x. Okay, so the game is <coughs> somehow encode the, 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 the set t, store it using a few bits, uh, and uh, so, so that you can later quickly compute the predecessor of any uh, input x. The predecessor is, it has to be an element of the set t, and it's the largest one that's uh, at most x. So the first element, you start from x and start walking back. And the first element that you see that's inside T is the one you want to output. And what we care about is we want the space used here to be small, and we want the running time uh, used to compute P of X to also be small. Where here the running time is just a number of queries made into this data structure. Okay, so let's let's uh, talk about two sort of trivial algorithms that you can you can do. One trivial algorithm is just write down t, uh, write its indicator vector. Just store it uh, sort of in the clear. This will take only n bits uh, to encode t. So, so just use the indicator vector. <coughs> it's, uh, order, uh, it just takes n bits to store it. But then the time you might take to answer such a query might be really large. Because you, maybe the, the natural algorithms, you just go, you know, you'd go to location x in the bit vector. If that's a 1, you output x, but otherwise you need to start walking back until you see the first 1. But uh, that could take linear, linear time. So it could be, could be uh, time n. Okay. So that's not too great. Another, another option, if you really care about having the time be really fast, is... Uh, is just uh, you know store all queries. So basically, you 
<laughs> maintain a huge table, okay, where S is, uh, uh, oh, actually, no, it's, it's only n log n, right? Uh, or uh, it's n and uh, it's log n, n words. words. N words. N words, and each one is, is log n. Yeah, actually, I, I'm just thinking, I realize now that for, for, for this problem to make sense, I have to think about set, small sets, right. Yes. Right. <laughs> which I, is a detail that I thought I could gloss over, uh, but now I see that I cannot. So, so actually, uh, the, uh, yeah, so in, in the problem here, this, the, the size of T is also bounded. You could at least have like a third trivial solution, which is to use like a binary search tree. Yes. Um, yeah. So you can also do. Uh, so so here t becomes one. Okay. So maybe. So this this so this this trivial solution is just you store you precompute all the values p of x, okay, ahead of time and just store them, and then you can look them up. And in general, this is something you can do for any data structure problem of this type. You know, you look pre-compute every possible query that could be asked and, and, and store its value. But uh, here it actually didn't cost that much. But uh, if in general, problems, uh, you know, if the input here is large, that would be extremely expensive. Yeah? But you, you really want, in this case, to be have storage around k or k log yeah. n or something like that. Yeah, so, so these are both expensive. Yeah. yeah, these are both expensive when k is so you wouldn't have the indicator vector. You'd have a list of elements. So yeah. Yeah. Actually, logic. yeah. You're right. Yeah. The trivial solution here should be like k log n. Uh, or no. Yeah. Yeah. K log n. Right. Right. But then a sorted list, and then you would need to. Oh, you. Okay. I, let's not worry about it. Because <laughs> it's uh, detracting from. Yeah. So the trivial solution is uh, there's there's something else that you can do that's easier. That's. Yes. Um, but there there is a really the right. There's a beautiful data structure that solves this problem, uh, and it's uh, very clever. It's called uh, Van M. Dubois tree. And it has these parameters. So you can have S that's like uh, K log log N. <coughs> okay, right. There's probably a lot of fudging going on here. And uh, T is also log log n. Okay. Each, each word will be log n. Okay, so this is not... So k log n bits are required to store the, just the set. Okay, if it's a set of size k, just to encode the set. And this uses another uh, log log n additional factor. And then it's able to answer queries uh, really fast uh, in log log n time. Paul, did I do something wrong? Um, I, I've, I've written things in a way that's different from how people usually explain them uh, in order to make them translate well to yeah. communication, but uh, I may have uh, made some fudging there. Anyway, the, it's, like I said, uh, you know, let's not worry too much about the parameters. The, the main thing I want to communicate is how this relates to communication and how you can reason about this thing, which seems to have, uh, it's not immediately seem like it has a communication protocol in it using communication protocols. So let's, let's talk about that. So in fact, this protocol, uh, this, this, uh, this data structure is tight. Not for the static case. No. Well, it's tight, I mean. Uh, up to a log log, up to lower order terms, right? If you, you can get better time with marginally larger space, like k, k to the 1 plus epsilon space, you can get a little better time. Right. If the, if the space is, right. So, OK. Yeah. So yeah, there's some sense in which this data structure is tight. You cannot strictly improve all the parameters. Uh, that's that's the, maybe the claim that can be made. There, but there's many parameters here, so there's a trade-off. Okay. But uh, I guess what Paul is saying is that if s is maintained to be like this, you cannot have t to be substantially smaller. I think the lower bound says t must be at least log log n over log 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 n. 
or maybe even that's... Yeah, even with polynomial in K. But if you want this K log log N, this is tight. Oh, okay. But uh, again, I'm not going to... So th that's uh, work of uh, uh, Itai and then Paul and, and Fitch. Um, and then uh, uh, Petrasco and Thorpe have subsequent work on it. So there, there's a sequence of papers analyzing this and showing uh, that this data structure is the right data structure. <clears throat> I want to say that there are many nice open problems here that where we don't, you know, this is a, a natural problem, but there are other natural problems for which we, we don't have uh, tight lower bounds. But I guess you will, there's a whole workshop on this subject, so you will see more about that. But let's now talk about how you can use communication complexity to reason about this problem, okay, or any data structure problem. And the, the idea is... Can you give us a sort of rough idea of this exact theorem that you're going to prove? Or like, oh, um, can you say something like if s and w are less than such and such, then t will be at least so much? Yeah, so if I, I actually haven't been able to... Maybe, so the, the, the theorem looks something like... Uh, uh, it looks like something like uh, either uh, T is, uh, I actually didn't write down. Okay. Yeah, maybe, I'll, maybe say something is not satisfying to you. But <laughs> either T is like this or uh, S is like this. This is roughly what it looks like. And W, what happens to W? And a W is a parameter that shows up here. So there's some trade-off between these two, and they're sort of terms that depend on W in, in this. Yeah, so these kinds of results are uh, sort of uh, clunky because there are so many parameters. Um, but often, the there's a, often they're expressed in terms of trade-off between time and space. OK, so <clears throat> let's not worry too much about the calculations, but let, let's see uh, how you can use communication to, to understand this. Um, so there is a communication protocol hiding in here, and, and that's this one. So suppose you have such a data structure, and it has those parameters. Uh, then just take, consider the, the problem where Alice has um, x, and Bob has t. And they want to just compute this predecessor. So it's, the function here is exactly the same as what the data structure is asking you to evaluate. But what you get from any such data structure is a protocol. And, and that protocol looks like this. In the first step, you know, this algorithm that makes t queries, it goes to some location in this data structure, right? So what Bob will do is Bob knows the whole set t, so he will compute this array, compute all the entries of this array. And uh, Alice has x. So what Alice will send Bob is just log s bits that indicate where she wants to make a query in the data structure. So she'll send log s bits. And that will tell Bob that Alice look, is looking at this location. And Bob will respond with uh, w bits that indicate, that say what the contents of that cell are, what the contents of that area, area location are. And, and that's it. So they just repeat this uh, t times. Alice is basically executing the algorithm of the data structure, but she's not sending uh, Bob x. She's just sending the locations of her queries, and Bob is responding with the contents of the array. Yeah? This reduction works even for uh, adaptive data structures. Uh, what is an adaptive? Like you looked at the first bit, and then you decide which, which next bit you want to look at. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, the algorithm here is allowed to be adapted. So the algorithm looks bit, you know, location by location and decides where to look next based on where you're looking for. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so if you can prove a lower bound on this communication game, you prove a lower bound on the data structure. This is, is actually a meaningful reduction. The data structure is significantly weaker than a communication protocol. Uh, because sort of in communication protocols, Bob's response here in this round can depend on the messages that were sent before. 
in communication protocols. But in data structures, uh, Bob has a fixed response for every, every query made by Alice. Okay, so there's a loss when you go from, protocols are much stronger than data structures. So in particular, it corresponds to space almost S to the T. Uh, by the time you're done with the teeth question, there are T log S possibilities of <coughs> the final question. Uh, there are T. No, no, it's, it's a tree. It's an exponential yeah. family. Right, so, so that's, that's making an S to the T possible. It's basically an index. Yeah. Once so you uh, could code the whole protocol in a table where size. you're given the conversation so far, which is going to be a point log s times t. Right. Uh, so yes. You could all, you could simulate. So the protocol is between space s times t and space s to the t and times t. I'm not sure whether that's. Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's exactly what. Okay. Saying. One, one, one loss that happens for this kind of thing is that this means in this, so in this protocol, of, you know, you'll never be able to, pro, uh, there's a trivial protocol where Alice sends just x. Okay. Alice sends x. This is a trivial protocol. So uh, the lower bound you can prove can never exceed that. Okay. Because after Alice is, after they've communicated long enough so that the number of bits here is just encodes x, then in, in, in the protocol world, Bob can just know x, and that's the end of the communication. But in the data structure world, it doesn't help, you know, that, that upper bound doesn't have an analog. So this is where you can, there's a limit to how strong the data structure lower bounds you can prove in this way are. Doesn't it have the analog of if you've got, you know, if you know the number of x's, the number of queries, you could pre-process and store every possible an answer to every possible query. Right. Isn't that the same? Yeah, it's the same. Yes. That's the same with a single query. But uh, uh, when the queries are large, it's when you have one query, you know, Bob sees everything that was said, that's okay. Yeah. But when T is large, that's when the data structures become weaker because Bob doesn't have memory to remember what was said before. Okay, so, right. <laughs> this will probably be the, the last topic that I'll talk about, you see. Uh, so I, I just want to give uh, intuition for how you prove this uh, lower bound. Um, it goes, it go, the way it goes is the, the proof is uh, inductive, okay? It uses uh, what's uh, called uh, round elimination. Uh, in the literature, and uh, so so let me just show you a key step. So the the, the, the way the proof works is by induction on the number of rounds in, of communication here. Okay. So if there's zero rounds of communication, if there are no messages being sent, and the whole thing is trivial, there's no way to compute this thing. Uh, and now what we want to do is we want to say that if you have a protocol that has some number of rounds of communication, you can effectively eliminate one of the messages, the first one, the first message and get a protocol for, um, that has one fewer round of communication solving uh, uh, the, same, the same problem. Okay, so, <clears throat> so let me show you how to eliminate one round. Okay. So, suppose you have, uh, so suppose you have a T round protocol a protocol that looks like that, and uh, Alice sends his first message, n, which is uh, log s bits. <clears throat> the, the way the proof works is, uh, you, you, by induction, you design a hard distribution on inputs to this problem, where any protocol with this many rounds, with one fewer rounds of communication, must fail, must make an error. This is this you do by induction. And now I want to show that having this one more message also doesn't let you solve this problem. So, <clears throat> so you first, so by induction, uh, there's some distribution uh, 
No, I've written every, everything actually the, 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 the way you can do this proof is by thinking of distributions on inputs. So actually we'll prove the stronger fact that there's a distribution on elements x and uh, sets t where such a protocol must make an error if it's too cheap. <coughs> so there's a distribution on x uh, and t uh, uh, where the protocol makes a protocol with one fewer around uh, One fewer messages makes an error. That's a good probability of error. And now I want to take that distribution and make from it a new distribution on inputs where even this protocol will make uh, errors of good probability. Okay. And the, the intuition is basically we'll make it look like Alice is sending this first message and we'll make it look like uh, Actually, Alice's input can be thought of as many independent inputs, and only one of them is important. Okay, but Alice doesn't know which one of them is important. Uh, and, and that's how we'll, we'll get the lower bound. So now I'll just write down what they do. So the hard distribution, so let's say this distribution. So I'm going to construct a new hard distribution. It looks like this. Uh, you will take uh, R independent samples from me. And those samples, let me write them as uh, x1, x2, x3, xr. And then we have the sets s1, s2. So each of these is, is independent, but X and S might be correlated. X1 is correlated with S1, X2 is, oh, sorry, T. So these sets are T1 through TR. Uh, and here, R will be chosen so that it's much bigger than uh, log of S. It's much bigger than the length of, uh, of this message. <clears throat> okay, so, so now, what are the inputs to Alice and Bob, the new inputs to Alice and Bob? Uh, the new X will be just the concatenation of uh, x1 through xr. Uh, so just look at the bits of, uh, the bits of x will just be the concatenation of the bits of, bits of x1 through xr. So the most significant bits of x will come from x1. The next most significant bits of x will come from x2. So in this way, I've combined these numbers into one number. And this is a number from a bigger universe. So I'm sort of changing the parameters of the problem. Um, but that's okay. So these are the bits of x. And uh, the bits of s, uh, uh, bits of t, <laughs> uh, or, or the, the set t is going to look like this. So we'll also pick uh, uniformly random i from r. Maybe I'll, I'll write uh, right here. So, so x is just the concatenation. And then uh, let uh, i be a uniformly random coordinate. Now, your goal is to, to so that um, that determines which xi you really are want to ask exactly, about. Exactly, yes. Yeah, so I want to say that in the final problem that I make, only one of these x's will be relevant, and that will be xi. Okay. Mm -hmm. so now I need to construct the set t so that's true. So that like t has only has like the elements of ti but padded with zeros in the more significant bits and ones in the less significant bits, something like that. So t, I need to make the most significant bits here up to the ith one irrelevant. 
So how do I make them irrelevant? Every element of T is going to have the same more significant bits. And then in the ith block, the, the, the elements will come from T sub I. And then the, the elements afterwards, you can just set them to zero. So this is T. So you gotta write it pictorially and not worry with formulas. So T, every element uh, that belongs to T looks like this. It has exactly the same values in X1 through Xi minus one. Here, it's an element of uh, T sub I, and here it's zeros. Is it important to put the bit, make the bits in the front um, random or something? To... Um, <clears throat> well, they have to match up with what Alice has. So I can't reveal to Alice what I is. So from Alice's perspective, everything has to be exactly identically distributed. So these also have to be distributed in the same way. Oh, but then don't you have to set the, the, the from, okay, from Alice's point of view, but not from Bob's point yes. of view? Yes. The, the crucial thing is this reduction is only when Alice is sending this message. This is the message I'm eliminating. Okay. And, and when I'm eliminating Bob's message, I will do a different reduction. Oh, I see. Okay. There's going to be another step. Yeah. Okay, but uh, <coughs> close out of time. So I'll just say what the intuition here is. What you can do using information theory is show that, so now, if these are the inputs, right? So what's happening here is the, the predecessor here of x, uh, of x in t is basically determined is by the predecessor of xi in ti. Because the first i minus one bits of all the numbers in this thing are exactly the same. The first i minus one blocks. So only the ith block is important. That's the first thing. So if you can compute this predecessor, you compute the ith block. But Alice has no information about i. What she sees is just this. They're all identically distributed. There's no information about i. Bob knows ex exactly what i is, but he's not the one who's speaking right now. So Alice is sending this message. And the, the intuition is that because this message is, has fewer bits than the number of coordinates, there will be one coordinate where she, she reveals very little information, much less than one bit of information. The average coordinate. The average coordinate, she will re reveal very less information. It, it, so that's the intuition. So then you can fix her message and fix all of this, and you get a reduction to a protocol that solves the problem on, on just this ith block. And this first message didn't help at all. It had no information about the ith block. That's the intuition. And uh, uh, maybe I'll leave it as an exercise. So this is this reduction, but if, if you want to eliminate a message from Bob, you do exactly the same thing. You need to do a different operation. Now you want i to be known only to Alice. Actually, it's, it's even simpler in that case, so maybe I'll try. So the, the way uh, you actually think of the universe, uh, or you, yeah, you, you so suppose this is the universe. You think of uh, x as having a pointer into the ith part of the universe. This is x, this is xi. And Bob has uh, sets, these are now the indicator vectors of the sets that look like T1, T2, TR. This is other reduction. So Bob you know, views their set and takes a disjoint union of his sets. But actually only the i-th set matters. He doesn't know which, which one is the i-th set. And Alice just has an, uh, a number from that i-th set. Okay, so it's the same thing, you take independent samples, but now uh, Alice knows which coordinate is relevant and Bob doesn't know. So you can eliminate the next uh, round of message with the same intuition about information. There's a question on the other side. Of that. Yeah. So doesn't uh, Bob's reduction increase k, the size of t? Increase k. Like Alice's reduction keeps the same size of t. Does Bob's reduction keep it too? Uh, it does increase it, yeah. yeah. That's not what we want, right? Well, so you, then you have to 
do the computation of the parameters to show you, you still you get you get some lower bound for a different value of k, and this k is growing, so you need to control how it. So it's a complicated calculation, but uh, you then need to make sure it's not growing too fast, and then you still get something. Yeah. So I think here the w is going to be much larger than the log s, right? So Bob's messages are going to be much longer than Alice's messages. Uh, yeah, e yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Is smaller than n, and s has to be like poly and k. Uh, yeah, I don't. Uh, it sounds like you understand it. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, so, so the, in the argument, are there like parameters that you tweak based on the relative sizes of s and log, log s and w? Uh, so the, 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 in the argument, the only parameters, well, I think the only thing you need to worry about is you need to set r to be bigger than log s, and the error that you get from this argument <laughs> should be good enough to apply it for t runs. So this is how you choose the size of these universes. And then, then you need to sort of calculate what lower bound you get for every taking of stw. This is, I don't have any more intuition than, than that. Did you have... In one round, for example, n, if previously you had n uh, uh, as a universe size, after one round it's going to be like n to the log s. Yeah. And there would be a similar yeah. kind of a trade off on the, uh, right. on the so p one, side. But the thing like n to the w would be much worse than n to the log s. Uh, yeah. So I'm wondering if there's some way of favoring that. So. My, my recollection of this is that w, the parameter w actually doesn't, you know, it does. It depends rather weakly on the parameter w. Like the lower bound works for a wide range of w's. You don't have so to even if it's poly log n. And it, log even n. if it's like two to the log to the one minus epsilon. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so I'll stop there.